Yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, so my colleague over here, Andrew Bernstein, he's a, he's a litigator at Tories. And Andrew and I, I guess, we would like to tell ourselves that everyone has packed this room today to hear us speak. And, uh, but it's probably because you're here to listen to these two eminent jurists. So directly to my left is Justice Grant Huscroft of the Ontario Court of Appeal. And Justice Huscroft was a professor for many years at, at Western. That's right. Okay. And, uh, and Justice Darla Wilson beside him, who is on the Superior Court of Justice. And she was previously a civil litigator, like I'm sure many of you are, like I am. And uh, the common thread between all of us, except Andrew, is that we all went to Queens. So Andrew's sort of the lone U of T guy here. But I feel okay because we're at U of T. <laughs> so I'm, I don't feel too isolated. So today we're going to be talking about uh, litigating constitutional issues primarily, but I also want to talk about just litigating any legal issue, any issue of statutory interpretation or common law doctrine, and, and, and the theme is going to be basically, you know, we, that we talk about these high-minded concepts at this conference every year, but how does all of this play out when we're actually in the courtroom? Because as, as anyone who litigates knows, theory and practice can be two very different things. Uh, so my, my first question to, um, I'll, I'll ask both of you, and e either of you can jump in, um, is just how do lawyers balance their duty to their client on the one hand and, their, and to the court on the other? So lawyers, we all know lawyers have a duty to zealously advocate their client's position, and that means putting forward your client's best case possible. But we also have a duty to the court as officers of the court to, to be ethical, to be honest in our submissions. And, and so how, how ought lawyers to strike that balance? How can we make sure that we're putting our client's best case forward uh, while also staying within the bounds of our, our uh, duty and, and oath to the court? Well, uh, a great question to kick us off. Uh, first of all, let me just thank uh, Mark uh, Mancini for the invitation to be here and Asher for helping put this together and Andrew. Uh, it's an absolute delight to be here and to, to chat with you today. Um, so I could say so much on that question, that's what, but I'm not going to I, because I don't want to be one of those guys. So let me just mention a couple things that seem to me to be important. Uh, I find every case is argued differently. Uh, people from the great law firms would all argue a case differently and I find that odd and interesting all at the same time. For example, uh, very few lawyers uh, we use secondary authority, by which I mean academic articles. Now, I'm an academic in a prior life. Uh, one of the first things I would think of is, I wonder what's been written on this. Has the, has the, the theory of this been canvassed? And often it hasn't. But I appreciate that you have to balance uh, the cost to the client versus the good that's going to be done. You might survey the articles and you might say, a lot of nonsense, I've wasted a lot of time, I can't build this. I understand all of that. So sometimes though, I, I end up doing that yourself. You look into things yourself, you have to. But I do expect that counsel are going to ap apprise the court of the relevant uh, authorities at least. So the relevant uh, judicial decisions. And the, the, the disparity I find is that some of them where the Court of Appeal for Ontario, some lawyers will come in and argue only Ontario cases. And they'll argue even low-level Ontario cases. And my first question will be, is there any Canadian appellate authority? And if I get the answer, I don't know, I hate that. Because <laughs> um, it means I have to look into that myself. It's not like I can decide the case unaware of what the law is and maybe maybe do real harm to the law. So I want to be apprised of the relevant appellate authority. What if there's a coordinate level trial authority from another province? What's your obligation there? Seems to me if you know about it and it's harmful to you, you better tell me about it because uh, I'm likely to find out for myself and I, I won't appreciate that. Um, you don't want to do anything that runs the risk of having the court fall into error by not considering the relevant authorities. It's one thing not to have them canvas the, uh, the secondary literature. On the authorities part though, um, again, it, it depends the type of case it is, and I won't go on too much longer, but, but if it's a case about the common law, if it's a contract case, let's suppose, or a case about land law, 
one of the questions I always ask is, what's the law of England on this? Have you looked at that? It's common law, English common law that we're dealing with here. Uh, our contract law is not, I used to teach contract law, it's not very different. Uh, and usually nobody's going to have looked into that. They'll have the Ontario cases. And if those cases happen to have touched on something, it might, might or might not be helpful. But again, I'm probably going to look into that myself, and I have to do that. But the point I'm making is the court isn't bound to decide something within the context of the argument solely. You, you've got an op opportunity to apprise the court of the relevant authorities. If you don't do it, the court's going to have to do it for itself. And you might find a case decided on some case authority that you didn't raise. Now, some people would say, that's out of line, the court shouldn't do that. I think there's a point at which if, when we're looking at the case after it's been submitted and we find ourselves going in a particular direction, maybe it'd be appropriate to call for submissions if it's something that wasn't canvassed. Or if some new authority comes out while a matter is under reserve, right. mm -hmm. we might call for, for submissions on that. But it's really best to give us the most help up front that you can. Um, I'm wondering if that uh, changes depending on what court we're in. So Justice Wilson, you're in the Superior Court. Mm -hmm. uh, how important is it for you to be seeing these, uh, these decisions from other jurisdictions, or are you typically wanting litigators to come to you to just bring you know, Ontario Court of Appeal decisions because that's what's directly binding on you, or, or do you also want to see English decisions and BC decisions, Alberta decisions? Well, I, I think that depends on the nature of the case, and you have to appreciate that, you know, if you're sitting in, in Toronto on, on the civil team, then you would do a fair bit of time uh, sitting in motions court and, and hearing various applications, and those can be across the board in terms of their subject matter. And so, from my perspective, sitting, you know, as a trial judge or as a as a motions judge, I agree with what Justice Huscroft has said about about the case law because it could well be an area that I or or one of my colleagues has no familiarity with, and so I rely on the lawyers to tell me what the law is in that particular area, you know, depending on the nature of the application or the motion. And so, I mean, a good advocate is someone who brings the relevant um, authorities to the attention of, of the judge. And, you know, often you'll see lawyers who don't include cases that aren't helpful to their side. And I think that's a very bad practice because, you know, you have to address the cases that help you as well as be able to distinguish the ones that don't. And, you know, if in your materials you're not giving the court what it needs in order to understand the law of the application, then I, I think that's, you know, you're not really doing your job as counsel for your client and you're not really helping helping the court either and i've had i've had the occasion where i i don't think the law is is entirely contained in the materials before me and i have to do my own research or ask the clerk to do that and i find it I have to say I find it irritating if, if the clerk comes up with a case that is a relevant case and ought to have been included in the materials and I would probably comment on that in my endorsement, the fact that that this is an important case and it wasn't brought to my attention by counsel. So um, I think it's, it's important obviously to have the leading cases and depending on the nature of the application I think you might have to go further afield it, it really depends I think it at least from my perspective it depends on what exactly the the relief is that's being sought on on the motion or on the application okay could, could I just add that one thing that is going to sound make it even tougher for you uh, I was just complaining about not being apprised sometimes of the relevant authority you get other cases where someone will bring up a case, let's, a public, let's suppose it's some sort of public law litigation, and someone will say, well, here's a case from California. It's one of the cases cited. Here's a case from Ireland. I know a bit of Irish constitutional law as it happens, but not that much. I don't know anything about the law of California. I don't know if that's state level authority or federal authority. I don't know if that's a rogue circuit decision or a, a consistent one. I don't know if that's an aberrant case within that. I don't know anything about it. Right. Throwing in that kind of a case is, is just mischievous. That's mm -hmm. cherry picking of the worst sort. And usually I will call that out. 
-hmm. and say, you know what, you can't do that. I don't know anything about that. You don't know anything about that case. I don't know where you got it. But on the other hand, if somebody comes in and says, you know, the Americans have dealt with this, and across the circuits, there is a consensus that here is the approach. I'll say, I'm, that's great. It's tremendous. There's right. been some good level thinking done on this. What have you got? But the cherry picking is the problem. If you're going to get into international sources, I've always thought it was an ethical problem uh, that you're, you, you are duty bound, it seems to me, to apprise the court of Canadian relevant authority. You can't hide authority that's harmful to you. On the other hand, what if you're serving the domain internationally and you think, oh, geez, the law of England's wildly against me on this, on this common law point. I'll say nothing. Or conversely, here's a rogue case from this jurisdiction. I'll raise this. as That's problematic, it seems to me, if you're going to do incomplete work on, on you're going to mislead the court, and it's just not going to go well. So, so it sounds like for a common law problem where British law or American law could be on point, it's important to go to other jurisdictions. But if we're looking at, you know, specifically interpreting a Canadian statute or the charter, then you, you, you've got to be careful with going to, to other sources, unless, unless it's going to be on, on a, very, uh, a very relatable issue. Yeah, I think just, it's, it's all a judgment, right? You've got, how much, you've got a, a limited amount of money to put into the case on behalf of the client. You've got a limited amount of time to do it. You, 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 at, it's very hard to do. Uh, you're, you're juggling a lot of uh, different considerations. But one of the things that I think is helpful if you're making a, 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 con a contract or a land argument or something like that is just go to an English treatise. You don't need to do your work. On, just go and, and just see if you're roughly in the ballpark, if it, it might help you out. If you're doing a trust case, for example, it's little known, but the Australians are, are, are great trust scholars. They're big on equity. Australian equity law is really interesting. They had a divided court until long after we did. So they've got tremendous equity, uh, equitable jurisprudence. Um, in Bigger on equity than equality, perhaps, but there you go. <laughs> <laughs> we shan't make any comments on, on our Australian friends. Uh, so, you know, there's things you can look at that might be very helpful and give you a steer. You don't need to be doing original research in jurisdictions that it's hard to do. That, that's, that's, I think that's an unrealistic thing to ask of anybody. I'm, but I guess I'm just counseling, be careful if you are citing foreign things, right. not to mislead the court. Right. Uh, don't yeah, mislead I the court. That's don't the, mislead that's the court. <laughs> that's right. And because it can be embarrassing for the judge too, right? Because as I said, you know, we're not super specialists in every single area. And, and I remember when I was a new judge and I, I remember hearing a motion in the area of defamation. I knew nothing about defamation and the lawyers weren't specialists in defamation law, although I didn't know that anyway. And it was this motion and they both did a poor job on it and, and I followed one of their arguments and, and was overturned in the Court of Appeal and I still remember it. And, and it was because I, I didn't know the law and I, I wasn't sort of savvy enough at that time to pick up on the fact that, that the lawyers actually didn't, because sometimes you'll have a lawyer make a submission and the other side will correct and say, well, you know, my friends told you this, but actually, and so you can, you know, you can get a sense of where the law is, but, but that doesn't always happen. And so I think, I think as judges, you know, we're, we have to be careful about it because, and, and we do rely on, on the lawyer. So I think you have to be really careful in terms of the law that you cite and, and your submissions to the court on that. And, and I would just say, uh, Asher and I were in court yesterday on a defamation matter uh, against each other, actually, and um, <laughs> on an issue of statutory on an issue of statutory interpretation. And, and I will warn all of you against practicing defamation law without uh, some knowledge of it. It's become an incredibly specialized area. Um, it's one that Asher knows well. It's one that I know well. Um, but uh, you s every now and then see lawyers take on defamation cases and getting themselves and sometimes the court into <laughs> real, real messes um, because it, it turns out it's not just another tort. There's a million semi-arcane rules about, uh, about what you do and you don't have to do, and it's a tough area to be, uh, to be practicing in. I, I wanted to, so there you go. I, hopefully I just saved law pro a, a bit of money. And um, the... the I want to move into kind of the, the marriage of the theoretical and the practical when it comes to litigation. Uh, so, you know, we're here at the Runnymede Society. We're going to talk about some high-minded concepts. Um, you know, do we or don't we consider original meaning? You know, what do we make of a living tree? Um, you know, how do we deal with, um, you know, history? 
precedent, et cetera. And I just wondered for both Justice Huscroft and Justice Wilson, do, the, do you think about these issues when you're trying to deal with cases? Um, or is it more like, okay, the case is in front of me and I'm gonna try and deal with it based on the case law from the Supreme Court that we've got? And you know, in those areas where it, it's untouched territory, maybe sometimes this theory comes into play? Or is the process of judging kind of less theoretical than that? Me? Yeah. Uh, so the beauty of this, I could give you the easy answer, which is stare decisis. I, I have to do what the Supreme Court tells me. And I do my best to do that if it's discernible. Uh, <laughs> but the Supreme Court also told you that you can overrule them sometimes. <laughs> no, they said trial judges could. Oh, okay. I didn't say the court of <laughs> Um, so stare decisis is a, I think the question was put to Randy Barnett last night and it's a big topic for any theory of interpretation. It's one thing to have a theory and another to say, well, fine, but now we have to grab, we have to use that theory within the confines of this legal order. We have, ver in terms of vertical precedent, if the Supreme Court's spoken on it, I, it doesn't matter how they got to where they're going, whatever interpretive theory they've used, that's the answer for me. If on the other hand, though, we're in un uncharted territory, then it's a big, it's a big question. They have talked about how, to some extent, there has been guidance on how you do uh, constitutional interpretation. But I think everyone would agree uh, that reasonable people can disagree about how the charter is to be interpreted. Not only in terms of understanding uh, the meaning of, of charter rights, but in particular, doing the Oaks analysis. Proportionality is not a science. It's, it, it's, it's you know, um, there's a great tendency in Canadian law, and people always, I loved this when I was at law school, there was the judges who would reduce things to numbered steps, as though, it's, as though everything's now a mechanical process. And you put all the numbers on it you want, and it doesn't matter. It's something really difficult going on there. And even, in, so I take the Oaks test as set out, and it tells me what to do, discern the purpose, is it pressing and substantial, is it rational, is it minimally impairing? At each step of those, there's a lot of discretion involved in determining what, what the answer is. Just, just at the first step, identifying the purpose of the thing. The purpose is going to turn out to influence the way the whole analysis gets carried out. Uh, ben Oliphant wrote a, a great thing in the University of Toronto Law Journal a couple of years back about discerning purpose. It is amenable to argument with reasonable people. Um, rationality uh, performs virtually no function. <laughs> um, I don't mean that as a joke. Uh, Aaron Barak, the Israeli jurist, uh, wrote a book on proportionality a couple years ago. said, yeah, I think we need to get rid of that step. We don't need it. That's not doing anything. Right. Right, we ask, is the legislation contributing in some way to the purpose that it was passed for? Of course it is. It has to be, it'd be really odd if it weren't. Might not achieve Didn't it perfectly. Oaks, well, I think the only case to ever actually fail on that step was Oaks itself, right? Yeah, uh, and, and most people think it's wrongly decided in that <laughs> respect. <laughs> that it's not a rationality case, it's a minimal impairment type case. But in any event, um, then you get to minimal impairment. Minimal impairment is, is, is again, reasonable. Disagreement is all over the place there. Uh, so again, I can be told, here's what you do, but in terms of how you then go about doing it, the methodology uh, of doing it, it, it can be quite difficult. Um, and I think different judges bring different things to the table in doing that. But the biggest, the biggest problem area for adjudicating uh, under the Charter would be the last step. And so a lot of people over the years have thought the last step doesn't mean anything. And Peter Hogg used to say that he thought it was essentially redundant in light of the first three steps. That's not the European conception of equality, which is that the fourth step is the, the, the big one. Everything else is setting up for the fourth step. The fourth step is asking you, all things considered, do the salutarious effects outweigh the deleterious? Well, weighing is a metaphor because we're not talking about anything that is concrete. We're, not talk we're talking about a loss to free speech on the one hand versus a gain to public policy maybe in less discrimination if, if it's a hate speech law. I can say, well, I prefer this to that or that to this, but I can't prove that this outweighs that. They're immeasurable. They're, they're, uh, they're, um, they're not comparable. <laughs> they're, there's a, a whole bunch of things I can say at a theoretical level about that. 
point is, I just have to do it. I have to make it work. And all the judges have to go through that four-step analysis if we're doing charter litigation. So back to the, the answer, what do you do and wh where does theory come in? There's very few things 30 odd years into the charter that are blank slates anymore. So we have methodology even for rights that haven't been, our, that haven't been well adjudicated yet, have to follow it. There's a lot of scope for uh, judgment in applying it. And I think there's room for reasonable disagreement. So just to pick up on that, because Section 1 can be so subjective and, and so much about value judgments, uh, you know, that this could be, you could give a depressing answer to this question, but do things like original meaning, living tree, does that really matter if at the end of the day there's going to be this extremely value-laden Section 1 analysis? Well, um, living tree, uh, sorry, the basic thing that has to be done first in charter analysis is a statutory is an interpretive enterprise. Right. What is the right? So at that stage, it but in identifying what is the right, there's not a lot of work done by interpretation mm -hmm. because the concepts are vague. They're not rule based. If in your constitution it says the president has to be 35, <laughs> we have to interpret that. That is what it is. I don't see any room to argue about what that means in terms of semantic meaning. I also don't see any emanation of rules that have to be decided or established to make that work. Sure. If on the other hand it's what does freedom of expression mean semantically? No, no work's being done there at all. It's all in the creation of the rules to give effect to that vague, vaguely worded concept. So you, you establish those, and then we have to get to um, uh, section one. So in terms of the living tree, uh, the living tree overlaps tremendously with what Professor Barnett was talking about last night when he was talking about cons the construction zone the new originalists would call it. So after you've determined what the thing means, you've got to say, well, what sorts of, of, of secondary rules can you make to give effect to that mm. thing that you've just identified the meaning of? That construction uh, process is very much like the living tree. So it's how the Americans give effect, for example, to protecting text messages under the First Amendment. Obviously, there wasn't a lot of cell phones in 1791. Uh, they were really big. They were huge. giant. Yes. There were people carrying them and dying. Briefcase, yeah. So, but freedom of speech is what it is, conceptually. So it, it, no originalist has any trouble saying, of course, it covers that. That's a construction of it. That, that's a, an application to modern circumstances. The overlap with what's living, const, living tree or living constitutionalism, as the Americans would call it, is pretty complete. The question is, in the living tree and in, in originalism, is how far can you go? So the living tree metaphor itself says the Constitution is capable of growth and developments within its natural limits. So what are those limits? And what Barnett would say, I think if he was here, is well, the, the limits are identifiable in the meaning you've attributed to the first stage in some way. They have to be. And I think the overlap is, that's the, the point I want to make. Okay. Justice Wilson, do you, uh, do you have thoughts that you want to share with us on this? Well, you know, at, at the trial level, we don't encounter those sorts of issues um, very often at all. I, I would say <clears throat> we, we see the issue of, of interpretation most often when there's, you know, someone moving, for example, to strike a pleading as, as not disclosing a, a cause of action. And so cases like that, you, know, you take a look at the law, but really what it is, is is looking at the facts of that particular case and trying to interpret the statute to see whether or not, you know, the, the current factual underpinnings can, can fit in. And so some of those cases are, are difficult because because they're quite novel, but in I would say 90% of them they end up going upstairs to the court of appeal, and that's really where where the analysis is is done. So, you know, it's it's funny sometimes at at my level you'll have, for example, like like Andrew and Asher had yesterday, I think a, a five day. I guess a mo it was a motion as opposed to an application. A 137.1 motion, an yeah. anti-slap motion yeah. that, that went on for quite a while yes. for a variety of reasons. And so you do get those, you know, from, from time to time, certainly not, not the steady diet, but, but, you know, a lot of it really, I think, is, is turns on, on the, the, the interpretation that, that the judge 
puts on on the statute and and it's it's but it's really a lot of it is is a fact finding process right at at our level. Pastor Jordan. Okay, so th this next question is more directed at Justice Huscroft because he was a professor. So Justice Huscroft, when you're a professor, you're in the classroom or you're interacting with students, doing a lot of this high-minded constitutional discourse. Now you're a judge, you're sitting in a courtroom and you're having somewhat similar discourse with the lawyers who appear before you, maybe. Um, I, I guess the question is, is how would you, um, how does the rigor of the discourse that happens in the classroom compare to the rigor that happens in the courtroom? And, and how are they similar and how are they different? These are, you know, I just want to let, let you know, we don't have these questions in advance, so I, I don't know what. Uh, now like, you know how we feel when we appear in the Court of Appeal. Uh, I, I can be difficult in, in court sometimes. I, I uh, challenge, I like to do that. And I like to do that in, in a, a class seminar as well. And I think you do best with the ideas if you're airing them and discussing them and, and, and thinking about them aloud. Uh, and, you know, candidly, a lot of counsel don't like doing that. They, they come in with their, their factum, which we've all read, <laughs> and, and then just want to walk us through it. And I think, oh, geez, uh, really? Um, now, good counsel would say, it seems to me, I'm in the court. They've read this. They've all read this. They've prepped it. I am there to answer questions, and I'm going to pretend that I enjoy it. <laughs> and everybody has fun, and it goes really well, and we get to the bottom of the problem. Um, that's a really good use of, uh, of our oral argument time. Um, but again, the analogies with classrooms aren't good because uh, you know, the lawyers are being paid to be in court. They wouldn't be right. there if they didn't have to be, and the students I don't know, some of them, sometimes they were there, they didn't want to be, they're not as motivated as you think, they're not, it's not the romantic sort of uh, thing you see on, in the movies about uh, people being educated, but um, <laughs> the, you, you should show up at court wanting to have an argument. I mean, if somebody's having an argument with you from the bench, think of it this way, they're interested in, in the point, and they're trying to understand it, and it might be, you could misread this entirely, it might be that you think they're giving my position a hard time. No, they like your position. They're fleshing it out for themselves. They're with you on the bottom line here. They just are trying to make sure they've got it. Or it could be they're wildly against you and it's going to go horribly for you. But you don't know that. <laughs> you don't know that. Sometimes and you kind of know. <laughs> you, you can read you can it. Tell it, the judge. it depends on the judge, yeah. yeah. You can um, read the tea leaves sometimes. And sometimes I ask not sometimes a lot of questions. And I, I, I like to hypothesize and I say, well, what if this, what if that? And some people hate that, I can tell. And others love it. And I think you should try to like it because that's going to be helpful to your client. And it's, especially if we're developing the law a bit. You have to know that it's well beyond, it's transcending, we've identified something that transcends the interests of your client. And we've got to make sure it's right for everyone. So yes, you are going to be on the spot to answer the implications and so forth. And rather than regretting that, you should say, that's what I'm there to do and it's going to be good. And, 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 and should people, should lawyers who are coming to court have regard to what, to which judge they're appearing before and what that judge's background is? So you know, if, if someone's coming before you, do you expect the lawyer to have taken uh, stock of the fact that you're an ex-constitutional law prof, that you probably want to have this sort of discourse on, on the, the high-minded issues? Like, do, do, you, uh, do you appreciate when a lawyer comes with that in mind already? I guess I would say I'm surprised if, if counsel haven't looked into who the bench is. We, I think we announced it on the Friday or the Thursday the week before. That's the first thing I would do. I'd look to see who the panel is. And I'd say, right, I got that Huscroft. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, if, if you don't like asking, answering questions, you say, well, he might well. He might not, but he might. Or, or you look to see who the other two are. But the point is, when you get there, if you've decided, oh, I've looked in this panel and so-and-so is the expert, I'll address all of the argument to Justice Wilson and I'll ignore the other two, that's not going to go very well because there's two other votes you've got to get. Right? Yeah. You've got to be amenable to the whole panel. You've got to under, you'd be able to read the panel, see what the interests are, see what the concerns are. If you're appearing before a single judge, very different problem. 
uh, which Justice Wilson could speak to. Well, it is a diff it's a different problem, but I think Asher's point about knowing who your judge is is really important. When I when I was a lawyer, you always checked on on who your judge was because because it does make a difference, you know, knowing knowing their background and and I think you have to tailor your argument, you know. Um, <clears throat> If, if you have a, a judge that has zero background, and if I'm sitting on something, I tell the lawyers that, and I say, you have to explain this to me you know, in, in 101, because I don't have a background in it. On the other hand, if it's you know, some professional negligence case that I did as, as a lawyer, and I've done a ton of work on the bench, then you don't have to give me the basics. So you know, when lawyers try to start giving me basic principles, I know that they have no idea who I am. But, um, so I, I think that's, that's a good point. And I, I think the other thing I would say is, um, I think the factums that counsel file are really important in terms of, of the argument. Um, as, as a, well, I mean, I demand factums for written, ar uh, I, I should say, factums and written argument at the end of a long trial. And, and I think they're exceedingly important also in, in motions court because the judge is not going to have time to read all of the cases, you know, when they've got a motion list as long as your arm, but they will for sure read the factums. And so um, <clears throat> when I sit in, in motions court or on applications, um, I always have questions for counsel, and if if they can't, you know, answer the questions, and sometimes there are questions that arise out of the fact of things that I simply don't understand, and that they can't answer my questions, or they they give me some sort of, you know, something that's already in the fact, and I find that unhelpful, and so I think you should. You should spend a lot of time on the factum, but it shouldn't be one of those facts that goes on and on and on. It should be concise. It should be persuasive. It should refer, you know, to the the most important cases and to, to the facts of your particular case. But you have to be able, I think, to field questions from from the bench because that means the judge is thinking about something and maybe something doesn't make sense. And I'm looking to you as counsel to explain it to me. You know, there there are times. Particularly when I was when I was a younger judge or more inexper more inexperienced judge, and I'd go back and I would be reading things, and these questions would pop into my mind, and I think, well, gee, you know, they never addressed that, and so I think it's really important that that you're able to to deal with those those questions um, from the bench because they're usually things that are perplexing the court, and they want some help on, right? And I, I will just add that. Um I, you know, if you're fortunate enough to have clients who will support this, um, a, a moot, particularly before an appeal, is a really, really good idea. You know, get, get three of your colleagues or people that you trust and say to them, look, here are the factums, and could you possibly sit, on a, sit down for an hour as I go through my argument? Be because you'll never be able to think of the hard questions that you're going to get asked. You're knee deep in the case, and you've been knee deep in the case for a long time. Um, but you have to, it's really, really helpful to not hear questions for the first time when you show up in front of the panel. And obviously, our Court of Appeal is full of people who ask hard questions, but um, you could probably find colleagues who are willing to ask you some pretty difficult questions too. And it is absolutely, and you know, the higher up you're going in the court system, the more of them you need. Um, if you're going to the Supreme Court of Canada, the Supreme Court Advocacy Institute will find you three experienced practitioners and will do a moot for you. And it's, I've done it a few times through the Supreme Court Advocacy Institute and it's the most valuable thing you could possibly do because there, you're gonna see some curveballs, um, and you don't want you know your first big big league appearance to extend the analogy to be the first time you've ever seen a curveball. So I, I know I'm supposed to be asking questions rather than giving answers here, but uh, I, I'm just gonna once again, I know we've got some students in the room and some of you will one day, I know it's hard to believe right now, some of you will one day be appearing in the Supreme Court or the Court of Appeal and a, and a moot's an important thing. I also had one client who liked to make me moot closing arguments for trial. And, and maybe not the whole you know, day-long closing argument, but they would say, like, let's hear what you're gonna say because we wanna understand what, judge, what, what are the difficult questions the judge is, is going to ask. So um, let's talk about common law for a minute. Uh, 
so I think when you're, when you're interpreting, when you're doing statutory interpretation, you have this pretty well understood process, right? You look at the legislation, you try and understand the statutory purpose, you cite Rizzo shoes because you have to, and, uh, and, and you interpret the statute in accordance with its purpose. We don't have this kind of routine when we're in common law. And obviously, there's some common law cases where you know the answer is pretty well understood. But there's also common law cases, and I'm thinking of one that's on reserve at the Supreme Court right now, having to do with pure economic loss um, in the context of uh, indirect damages. And uh, that's just an example. But how do you go about understanding uh, what you're supposed to be doing when you're talking about common law when the cases don't answer the question for you. Hmm. And maybe Justice Wilson, we've picked on Justice Hughescroft, so maybe we'll pick on you first this time. Well, I mean, that's, that's actually sort of a, a hard question, or it's a broad question to, to answer. Um, sometimes, you know, um, <clears throat> you get a, a case where um, the lawyers are making an argument and, and it's, something, it's something novel. And so, so you say, well, where do I go from here? And, and where do I start? And, and so sometimes the, the cases aren't helpful on it, right? And so you're trying to, to sort of figure it out. Um, and again, I mean, it's often a factual analysis and um, <clears throat> you get I mean I don't know you look at the cases and and you you try to understand sort of the reasoning behind them but it's um, it, it can be it can be very difficult and and I've often I should say often we don't we don't get those sorts of cases in in our court that often um, <clears throat> where counsel are are saying you know, we want to, there, there aren't any cases, this is what our argument is, and this is why, why we think it, it has some merit. So those are, I guess, difficult cases, and, and all, all you can do really is try and understand how the law has, has evolved, and look at the facts, I think, of, of the particular case, and, and then the nature of the case, and, and sort of there are times where you feel like you're making sort of your best stab at it, right? But trying to understand what what the analysis is, I, I've got one right now that I'm I'm wrestling with and and reading all sorts of, of cases and, and the lawyer said there's nothing there's nothing in Canada on on this point. This is but you know, this is how it should be and and so you you struggle with that and um, I don't know that there's Sort of an easy an easy answer to it because often times you look at at some of the cases and I, I find them perplexing because they they are inconsistent and so you're left to try and sort of and fig figure it out. Um, but I guess that's why they they go upstairs and Justice Huscroft and his colleagues can figure them out. I don't know. Well, so I guess we're doing this in the in the usual order. Yeah. First, we hear from the Superior Court on the subject. <laughs> then we hear from the Court of Appeal. Yep. Justice Huscroft, what do you do with those cases where there is no overarching statutory purpose? Mm -hmm. So I, I was making some notes to myself and uh, I think answering a different question than you've just asked. So um, <laughs> Answer whatever question you want. That's what lawyers do in the Court let, of Appeal. Let, let me do that. <laughs> let me do that. Let me take that. some liberty. So, let me look at the common law as, a pro, as an example of this. Um, from time to time, the court will get asked to do something for which there is no authority. Will you create a new tort? Sometimes it's phrased as, will you recognize a new tort, mm -hmm. as though it was imminent in the law and, and it just hasn't been noticed yet. <laughs> but is it, will you recognize it? Will you, will you create it, et cetera? Well, when a case like that comes up, that's a really hard problem. Because it's not answered by me saying, yeah, I think there ought to be. What do you think? And you're on the panel with, yeah, you think so too. Oh, you don't think so. You can dissent then. The two of us, we're going to create a tort because it would be a good idea. If that's the law, that ain't, that's not very good. That's not common law method. On the other hand, if you get 
too academic about this, you'd be looking at uh, uh, some theory that probably isn't going to be argued. The theory of the com the, this, the nature of the common law. What is it? I mean, it, we're, when we talk about the common law these days, we have to understand that we're doing common law in an age of statute law. Most things are regulated by statute. Most problems are fixed by statute. They're not fixed by either tweaking the common law or recognizing new causes of action, usually. Seems to me. Mm -hmm. Like, people used, when I was teaching contract, people used to say, well, here's the problem. And I'd say, well, that's covered by the Sale of Goods Act. Right. Or here's the problem. Well, that's the door-to-door -door sales act, or whatever it was. Or that's the consumer, I was in a different country at the time. Different, there's all these statutes that are addressing particular problems. It's not fixed by offer, acceptance, consideration, theory, or any of the other stuff you learn in contract, or the postal acceptance rule, remember that? <laughs> a couple of people do. Um, but um, <laughs> statutes fix a lot of problems. There is so, some room still to develop the common law, but the question is, what are the things that govern the court or put constraints on what the court can do in developing the common law? Mm -hmm. That is a really difficult question. And so an example of that that I'll give you, that my colleague uh, just retired this week, Justice Robert Sharp. First of all, let me commend to you his book from last year called, uh, thank you. Uh, let me commend it to you his book. Um, <laughs> Justice Sharp uh, was a great judge. Uh, you would learn a lot about arguing a case if you just read how he looked at a case and the various things he discusses there. So I think, I want to suggest that to you, that's one thing. Second thing I want to uh, commend to you is uh, an article that's available online that was written by uh, now retired colleague John Laskin about arguing uh, an appeal case called Forget the Wind Up, Make the Pitch. That's a good article. Mm -hmm. After that's many years, good. that article stands up mm -hmm. really well. And, and hey, every law student should read that article. Yeah, it's a sure. great article for it's law students, long. great article for counsel. Um, and, you know, so let me, having mentioned uh, those two things, Justice Sharp talks about um, a tort that was recognized in Canada, I think was the terminology, in a case called Jones from a few years back yeah. about uh, intrusion upon seclusion. seclusion. Well, the beauty of that case was that you had a set of facts that was egregious. You had no apparent remedy possible. And you had a well-developed body of American law. It's not that hard to say, well, in the common law, yes, it's, we can recognize this is imminent, and or, it, however you want to describe that. That's not making up something out of whole cloth, which is quite a different thing to do, to, fix, to fix an apparent injustice and maybe give, put asunder various ver bodies of law. And, and as I can tell you from a practitioner's perspective, as probably right-headed as that tort was, you know, I've got clients who are all of a sudden dealing with a lot of class actions, pleading intrusion upon seclusion in very, very different circumstances than yeah. the circumstance that Justice Sharp faced in the Jones and Seed case. Yeah. So every, you know, every, every time the, the Court of Appeal throws a stone, the ripples kind of get bigger and bigger as they get but further and further. The point out. I'd make about Jones is that Justice Sharp didn't recognize a tort invasion of privacy per se. He carved out an aspect of the right. concept. Mm -hmm. right. It was incredibly modest, that development, albeit that people are trying to stretch it out now. So there's still some things you could do on the privacy front, arguably, uh, but and people will argue about that in the future. But I'm saying you need a theory of the common law before you can just go making up torts or, or changing the nature of them. That's the first point. Second point I've forgotten. Third point, um, <laughs> uh, you know, having said all of that and, and, and about tr assuming that the court is going to try to approach something in a principled way, it is sometimes the case that, and we remember this from law school, I, that judges don't approach things in a principled way. So I'm not going to use a Canadian court for this, but I, I was, I, it just popped into my head the great Lord Denning. I remember I was teaching uh, contract and teaching damages, and the concept of punitive damages comes up. And you know, punitive damages did not used to be a thing in contract law until Denning in, uh, and I forgot the name of the case, forgive me, but Denning dutifully in the, in the Court of Appeal, is he, he stepped back from the House of Lords, he was the master of the roles, he s listed all of the cases in which they'd said no to punitive damages. No, 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 no. Then he just said, and I think this is pretty much accurate, I think those cases are out of date. <laughs> and then awarded punitive damages. 
Well, that's the very thing I'm telling you you wouldn't do normally. But that's stuck. That's succeeded. And uh, nothing succeeds like success, as they say sometimes. Sometimes you can do that and get away with it. But in general, courts don't operate, operate like that and don't want to. They want to reason their way to something. And you know, if you're coming in and you want a new tort, then understand that conceptually that's a problem. If you're coming in and you're wanting to change the law dramatically, understand that you better have something more than here's a case. Or I think it would be a good idea. Or normatively, I'd really like this result, you know, et cetera. Um, so I hope that was sort of an answer to this. So I, I with, with hoping that I'm not um, stepping on Asher's toes, I just wanna, I wanna follow up on that um, with a, a, an even kind of more abstract question, which is the nature of stare decisis. Um, you know, we, we've seen, uh, and I have a bit of a, a soft spot for this because I wrote my master's thesis on Casey and Planned Parenthood, but, you know, we've seen courts say in the past, you know what, we may not actually even really like this result, but stare decisis is in and of itself a really important value, and so even if you don't like this result, we're going to stick with it. We've also seen courts, and, and Vavilov's a great example of this, say, you know what, um, we, this just ain't working for us any, you know, like, like, um, uh, like a bad relationship. That this, sorry, it's not you, it's me. Um, uh, this isn't working for me anymore. And we're gonna change it all around even though we have a, a long history together. Um, so, so I wondered if e e either of you, but really any of you, because I'd be interested in Asher's thoughts on well, this but too. Well, in Min Law, it's more like serial monogamy. <laughs> <laughs> every day, change partners every 10 years, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, um, I'm sorry, Ms. Ms. Dunsmere, I'm going with uh, Ms. Vavilov now. Um, but, uh, you know, do any of you have thoughts on how to balance these competing values between, you know, the, the stability of stare decisis and the practicality of something that maybe works a little better? Well, uh, I guess following up on, on what Justice Huscroft was, was talking about, you know, I, I've had the experience where counsel come in and make that pitch that there are no cases in Canada where, for example, this particular tort's been recognized, but I think on the facts of this case, you ought to, to do so. Um, <clears throat> so that, that argument isn't, isn't going to work because we're constrained, obviously, by, by the law, and so, I don't know in in terms of you know moving moving the law forward you know depending on uh, on what interpretation you want to put on it there there might be some room for it but but you know stare decisis matters and it matters to judges and and you can't just come in and say well it's a new world now and and this doesn't make sense anymore in 2020, and this is what you think, this is what you ought to be doing, um, be doing now. Um, I, I think that's that's problematic, and so when when I get that sort of a, a pitch, and and you do see it, you do see people arguing, particularly you know on the trial court and, and dealing with with tort cases, arguing, well, this is something new, this is something you you ought to recognize. I. I mean, I think that's that's problematic in in the vast majority of of the cases, right? So, I, I don't know, um, Justice Huskroft, what do you think on on that point? Um, um, yeah, it's a the, you know, books are written on stare decisis. We 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 mention it flippantly from time to time, but books are written on this. It's not an easy concept, and so it's a value of the legal system in terms of delivering certainty. And you don't want to lose because we just decided to change the law as Lord Denning did. You know, people are counting on certain things. Some laws, though, are easier to change than others, frankly. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and that's part of the calculation. If you're making an argument about stare decisis, this, to me, would be an example of a case where you'd really do well to look at some academic writing on this. And for example, Fred Schauer, Frederick Schauer, an American author, has written extensively on stare decisis. And he's brilliant, and his writing's accessible, yeah, and highly recommend it. And it will apprise you of lots of arguments that you will face, it seems to me, if you're wanting a court to change mm -hmm. 
change the law. But you got to come in armed with something mm -hmm. other than just, you know, I don't think you should follow this anymore. Well, if you're the Supreme Court, maybe you can change your mind like that. It's not easy for us to change our mind. And I, I will add that, you know, it's a problem in appellate courts in particular because we have a rule that a panel of three binds the court. Now, that's an odd rule with 29 judges, but there it is, three binds 29, uh, unless we appoint a panel of five to overturn or to visit the possibility of overturning a panel of three, which has to be requested and approved. And so if there's a panel of five and we know something, we're being asked to reconsider something, it's on the table now. You still have to make an argument about why we can do it, why we ought to do it, what, what harm or good is being done by, by liberalizing or constricting stare decisis in these circumstances. I would always approach it in that way, and not just mechanically, yes, I know what stare decisis is. It really does depend, and, and some things are very difficult to change. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll, I'll make this point about constitutional law in particular. On the one hand, KC and American cases like that talk about, and we've had Canadian examples as well, talk about stare decisis should have less pull in constitutional law, some say, on the one hand. On the other hand, some say, well, some things are so well established that, oh my God, it would be difficult, it would be awful to overturn it now. And that's a great problem for the originalists, the American originalists, the staunch ones, who want to say, for example, if they want to say Roe versus Wade is wrongly decided, 1972, it's almost 50 years old, that's a hard sell. Even if that's what you thought, to change the law now is a hard sell. Scalia would have said to that, no, no, I said all along it was wrong. It's not too late for me to say it's wrong. I, I said it was wrong in 1972, I'm still saying it. It wasn't too... Plessy versus in Ferguson was not too old to overturn because it was profoundly immoral. So it gets overturned in Brown and Board of Education. So that, that rule doesn't always work. Some rights, some things that are rights conferring are too, too difficult to pull back. Some things that are rights constricting were easily pulled back, you might conclude from that example. But that, even that would be a simplistic way of looking at this. So arguments for stare decisis sound differently in constitutional rights and in public law versus where there's more likely to be identifiable developments, it seems to me. Quite often you find courts very careful with the common law because they, they, of incrementalism. They're a lot more incremental, ironically, than, than with some of the bigger ticket things in public law where they, they flip it. You know, Rodriguez begets Carter. Mm -hmm. um, Burns and, or Kindler and Ng, you can't extradite anyone to the U.S. to face a capital sentence overturned in Burns and Raffae uh, 10 years later, whatever it was. Like, there's a lot of movement in the press. We've got a lot of examples of this. Yeah, yeah you, you could name a lot. You can't name that with the common law. If somebody comes along and says, you know what, that whole consideration theory and contract that you need, <laughs> it turns out it was wrong. Who yeah. knew? <laughs> you know, funny, actually, because I've been very critical of Rizzo's shoes over the years, um, but it seems like the court was bending over backwards to not overrule Vorbis. Um, anyway, uh, it's probably so, Asher's so turn to ask the question. Do we have uh, an hour or 90 minutes? Does anyone know? I thought we had 90 minutes. I'm going to look okay. at the brochure. You ask some questions. And <laughs> well, I, I'm just, I'm just going to add to that. that 3.30. Okay, that's what I, I thought. I just wanted to make sure. Okay, so I, I agree with, with what everyone has said about the importance of stare decisis. And, you know, I was, I was being funny about, or trying to be funny about Vavilov. But I do think that is one area where we don't have to give stare decisis as much weight because you go back to first principles and you say, what is the purpose of stare decisis? It is to bring certainty and predictability to, to ensure that when people come to court, there's a, a continuity of law. But where you have an area of law where there is no continuity, you're not upending much to say, well, the, the way we've been doing it for the last 10 years hasn't been working, so let's try this again, and let's try to actually get it right this time so we can start employing stare decisis. So I think that is one area because we, Historically, we saw that every 10 years, basically, the law of judicial review uh, was changing. But in, in other areas, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm very hesitant to, uh, as, as, a, as a practitioner, of course, you know, we, we have to make arguments on behalf of our clients, but as, a, as someone who, who writes about these things, I'm, I'm usually very hesitant to push back against, uh, against stare decisis because it is so important. But I take Justice Huscroft's points that it's, there can often be very nuanced analyses. Um, 
the motion that Andrew and I argued, we won't get into it, but there's, what did we say, Andrew? There's been 13 Court of Appeal decisions interpreting the section in, in the last two, two years. Two years, yeah. Less, year and a half. And wow. it's not clear if all those cases say the same thing. I wasn't on any of those panels. Was That's it? true, you were not. <laughs> there we go. No, it was all, almost all Justice yeah. Doherty, Justice Nordheimer, Justice Perdue, and, and a few others. Yeah, but, but, and but, it, it speaks to Justice Huskroft's point that three can bind 29, and then you get an, a, a new three, and, and they say, oh yeah, we agree with what the other three said, and, but you know, they were, I know you think they were saying this, but really they were saying more of this, and suddenly, it's not overturning the precedent, but the law very subtly shifts. And Andrew and I were dealing with this very issue yesterday that there's been this subtle and then, but over time, not so subtle shift in how things have happened over the last two years. Depending on who you believe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> subtle, not so subtle, but very subtle. It's, it's a really, it's really interesting. One of the things, so one of the things that stuck with me that was super, super interesting from a long time ago is I heard the chief judge. So I'm one of the things I do is some patent cases, and I was at a at a lunch where the chief judge of the federal circuit, which is the American uh, court that deals with the American appellate court that deals with patent cases, and the federal circuit has had a rough go at the Supreme Court of the United States. They they are really very much an expert court. Uh, they, they are almost inevitably patent specialists because that's 90% of their docket. And so they, they hear and decide these patent cases, they hear and decide them en banc, which is obviously not a tool that we have in our appellate courts, but the entire court will together hear it. And, and, the, and, this, and you know, only to regularly be overturned by nine Supreme Court judges who you know, basically never touched a patent case in their life until they got on the Supreme Court. And what the chief judge uh, said was he, um, he, he was listing five threats to IP law in the 21st century, and the fifth threat was the Supreme Court and generalist Supreme Courts. And he said, look, we appoint Supreme Courts to decide really big questions of like freedom versus security, uh, you know, <clears throat> economic liberty versus equality. That's what the Supreme Court is good at. What the Supreme Court is bad at is giving the kind of certainty to markets that, that markets need to properly function. And uh, you know, when you're talking about patent law, companies simply need to know whether their patents are going to be valid or invalid, uh, not um, you know, the kind of nuanced analysis that you conduct when you're deciding exactly how far freedom of religion goes when it clashes with equality. So it was a, I thought it was a super, super fascinating um, perspective. I'm sure, that, I'm sure that nobody here, but that some judges of the Court of Appeal find the Supreme Court to be a threat to all sorts of, uh, all sorts of things. But, um, but it, is, uh, it is a really, uh, it, it, my, it, I thought it was a really interesting perspective on what Supreme Courts are good at and what they're not good at. Can I, you know, uh, just a, a concluding thought about this, the stare decisis point that, that I think puts in I wish I'd said this earlier, it makes, would have shortened my remarks. You, stare decisis is only required if, if a decision is wrong. If you think it's right, you don't need a stare decisis rule. So really the way to approach stare decisis is you're saying, what's the value of upholding this decision that we think is wrongly decided as against something else? And you make an argument along those lines because that's what you're asking the court to do. Follow this even if you think it's wrong. Follow this even if it is wrong. Right. And then give me some reasons to do that. That's how you make a, that's, and again, I'll, I'll pitch Fred Schauer on that. You should, really, he's great on that. He's got another book called, for the law students here, called Thinking Like a Lawyer. And address, addresses one of Asher's points, it seems to me, which is that, okay, you don't have to overrule something, but you can distinguish it. Well, mm -hmm. and we, we're all familiar with the concept, except, how do you decide when a case is actually analogous such that you have to follow it? What does it mean, actually, that a case is analogous? We, these things are asserted a lot. Fred unpacks some of those ideas really well. Uh, again, uh, he taught it as an intensive course at Western a few years ago when wow. I was there. And uh, I thought to myself, I wish I'd, I sat and I loved it, you know, I took the course. I mean, I wish I'd had that when I was at law school. Mm -hmm. it, because we tend to just talk about things without thinking about what they're actually doing and why. 
No, I want to take the course. I have a kid. At, I have a kid at Western, at, not the law school, but at the undergrad, and could go hang out with him. I'm sure he wouldn't mind if I moved in for a week and took an intensive course. I, so, I would even bring the beer money. <laughs> so I, I will. We'll talk about one more thing, and then I think we can take some questions. Uh, yeah, because we're we're at uh, three right now. So I, I just want to bring it back to advocacy again. Uh, we touched on this earlier. This concept of being an officer of the court, so making sure that you, you give the court all the relevant material, even stuff that is going to hurt your case. And, and I think this speaks to a broader issue about lawyers making concessions to the court about aspects of their case that aren't, aren't helpful. And this can be something that's very difficult to uh, explain to a client if a client comes to court with you. Uh, because clients see you as being entirely their advocates. That's what you're there to do. And if a client sees you saying to the court, yeah, Your Honor, the, yeah, this, this case absolutely does not help our argument. It, it helps my friend's argument a lot more. They're going to take you aside during a break and say, why are you arguing their case for them? And uh, I, the answer to that, and, and I'd like to hear what uh, the justices have to say, but the answer to that is, first of all, we have to do it as, as officers of the court. But second of all, it can actually go a long way to helping in the long run with one as, as your credibility as an advocate and, and the credibility of your argument. Because if you're willing to make, my view is if you're willing to make concessions on certain points, then when you do stand before the court and say, but you know, I am absolutely right on this point, it, it carries more weight because you've been willing to, to admit where you're not strong. And so just wondering what your experience has been with that and, and with counsel making those concessions or not making concessions? So I, I think it's, it's probably different at, at the trial level, but I can say for sure that, that lawyers that make those concessions stand in you know, much better at, at having a, a better reputation before the court. One of the things you know, that I, I think we see on a regular basis is, is Every issue's on the table. The lawyers want to talk about every single issue. You know, nothing's agreed. Everybody's, you know, polarized on every single point. And that actually can't be true, whether it's a motion or a trial. I understand there are points you want to have adjudicated, but the days when I started out as a lawyer in the 80s where you just thought about everything, those are old days, and, and the, the judicial system can't actually, we don't have the resources to, to do cases that way, and we haven't for a long time. You have to be economical, you have to be efficient, and, and every case, you know, I've done lots of complicated long trials, but at, you know, they end up boiling down to a few issues. So when lawyers tell me, oh, this is so complicated, there's all these, we can't agree on a single thing, Your Honor, I think that's nonsense, and so, so you should be able to to agree on some things. And the things that you are arguing about, I think it's better to make the concessions, you know, this case isn't helpful or whatever, but be able to distinguish it, at least at my level, I think a lot of it is about being able to distinguish the facts of, of your particular case as to why, you know, it actually doesn't follow, you know, in that particular case, you know, and cases where, where counsel are trying to, you know, not necessarily make new law, but but push forward with a case that that is perhaps unusual or hasn't been recognized, but maybe has some legs to it. That sort of thing. I think that that you have to be comfortable arguing the cases. You have to know what the weaknesses and the strengths of your case in, in the larger scheme of things in terms of the law are. And, and you know, n failing to, to deal with a case that isn't helpful is not going to make, score any points with the judge because he or she's going to ask you about it for sure. You know, sometimes when I'm reading materials and I think, wow, this case seems like a complete answer to, to this party's position. What are they going to say about that? And then, you know, if, you, if I have good counsel, they'll be able to explain it to me in a way that I probably hadn't thought about, actually. So I think it's a really important thing for, for counsel to be able to do. Yeah. OK, and, and so Justice Hoscroft, in, in light of what Justice Wilson has just said, what, what are your thoughts on that? On? Well, on, on the fact that if, if you're getting, if, if you think that you have 
if, as the judge, if you think you have the answer, and then counsel comes to you and says, well, here's actually how, you know, I, I can explain this case that looks unfavorable, or maybe it is unfavorable, but here's why it doesn't matter that it's unfavorable. Um, is that something you deal with? Well, I, th I think that I agree with everything Justice Wilson said. I, I don't understand people not front-footing problems. Uh, you want the court to respect you, whatever you're, you want a tribunal, you want anybody you're making a pitch to to respect you. And not just to win that particular case that you're in because you're probably going to be back for something. Right. So it'd be very short-sighted to say, I'm going to just win it for this person and, and nothing else matters. That's going to go badly. You're there and you're helping the court. And you're helping the court by apprising the authorities we've been talking about, but also just being realistic about the position. And you might have to give away something. And I think the difference between our courts is that sometimes you can see it's going horribly badly, or you should be able to see that, hopefully. <laughs> and you can judge. And, and sometimes you'll just be asked, do you concede X? And if you're put, that's almost never a mischievous question. Nobody's trying to trip you up. It's like, we think it's going nowhere. Are you, do you really want to keep going? And, and, and good counsel will say, well, I'll, uh, you have my submissions on that, and I'll move to the next thing. Mm -hmm. And some will just cling to it like grim death and make the point over and over again. And I'm thinking, <laughs> no, you haven't understood. You know, you just. <laughs> so you have to read the thing. You have to notice, too, you know, if there's a panel of three people and you're making your submission, and I put the pen down, that's, that's a bad good. sign. That's not good. That's a bad sign that, you know, in my court, some people are typing, they stop typing. There's one, one court of appeal um, judge who used to turn around yeah. in his chair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that, that's not, yeah, that's not happening. But um, uh, you have to be able to read the panel, see what they're interested in, candidly uh, assess the, know how the thing is going, I think. And that, that can be tough, uh, especially on the fly. You don't want to give up something that you, you think it's an improvident concession. It might be helpful if you've got co-counsel there with you and they say, you know what, <laughs> you're taking a beating here. Give that away. But again, it, there's less to give away if you came in with a reasonable position at the start. And, and I, I wanted to pick up on something Justice Wilson said. We see quite often, um, we have 30-page limit on factums. Every, page, every factum is 30 pages. And it just shouldn't be. It just shouldn't. Not. So if somebody comes with a 15-page factum, I say, here's a confident person. Right. Here's a person raising one or two issues versus here's a 30-page factum. Mm -hmm. They're essentially with wide margins. They're wanting yeah. to retry the case. Mm -hmm. Their rate, everything is a palpable and overriding error. Not one, not two, not three, 12 or 15. And if that's right, then that is a thoroughly incompetent decision below. <laughs> that's just not going to happen normally. Um, if, if you're calling everything a palpable and overriding error, the first question from the bench is going to be something like, do you understand what a palpable and overriding error is? Yes. They're fairly rare. The whole point of the standard of review is to limit appellate oversight on some of these things. In the same way with judicial review oversight, it's not a redo. It's is this a reasonable decision? Right. Um, and so you got to be careful. You got to pitch the thing accordingly. You have to read the panel. There's a whole bunch of things that go into it. I think. But I think if you start from a reasonable position at the outset and you write a tight set of submissions, that's going to be really well received. And it's, then you won't have to give away anything. If you're just giving away bad arguments that shouldn't have been made in the first place, that hasn't helped you out all that much. And it's, it's been a huge waste of the court's time, actually, right? You know, it's, it's funny. At the end of, of a long trial, when, when it's a jury trial, you know, we do our charge and we summarize the, the evidence, right? And when I was a new judge, I used to feel compelled to summarize the evidence of every witness that was called. I thought I'd miss something. Maybe I'd get overturned upstairs. But, um, but now, you know, it's, it's interesting when you start looking at your notes and you think, what did this witness add? Like, why was this witness even called? I'm not talking about this witness. I'm not talking about that witness. And that, to me, is, is the lawyer's not focusing on what the issues really are. Um, and that's true, I think, of a motion. It's true of an appeal. 
appeal. It's true at, at trial. I think that you score a lot of points when you concede the things you should concede and focus on, on the issues that matter and make your arguments on those because, you know, there's not, you might have a couple of really good arguments, but if you're going on for hours, in our court we don't have time limits, you know, about things that don't matter, you're going to lose the judge's attention for sure. I, I will just say that the, the two gutsiest things I've ever seen, um, one uh, really an uh, example in what to do and one really an example in what not to do, but both equally gutsy. Um, as I, when I was clerking um, back in the late 90s, a criminal defense lawyer who'd clearly never been to the Supreme Court before came to argue an appeal. And he stood up and he made his argument in 20 minutes, you usually get an hour. And he looked at his watch and he said, uh, Justices, actually I think we were back in the Milord Milady days, Milords Milady, I, I know it's only been 20 minutes, but those are my submissions. It's Friday afternoon and I don't have anything else to say. You've, seen, you've read our factum, and if you have any questions, I'm here to answer them. And nobody asked any, him any questions um, because he was, he was basically winning, um, and, and the court hadn't asked him any questions at all. But he then just proceeded to sit down, and man, everybody appreciated that. So that's definitely an example in, in what to do. An example in what not to do, equally gutsy, but an example in clearly what not to do is a different criminal defense lawyer, and this was back in the days of... Um, they used to call it the Gang of Five. Uh, Chief Justice Lemaire, Justice Yakabuchi, Justice Corey, Justice Sapinka, and Justice Major were very, wrote a, a series of very pro-defense um, Section 7 charter cases. And a uh, criminal defense lawyer was there making one of these arguments. Justice Leroux Dubay was giving him an extremely hard time, an extremely, extremely hard time. And he said to her, Justice Laura Dubay, uh, no disrespect, but I knew I wasn't going to have you. I'm trying to convince five of your colleagues. Um, yeah. Not a good idea. Did not in, in, at all uh, endear himself to any of his <laughs> colleagues. But, uh, uh, you know, some people have guts. Um, some people have guts where their brains should be. But uh, that's <laughs> b both examples of very gutsy things. So don't insult judges when you're before them. That's it wasn't an insult. It was a dismissal, yeah. right? It, w it wasn't you're a bad person. It was I, I never expected that you would agree with me. So why are we talking? <laughs> so why don't, we, uh, why don't we take some questions now? I think there's a microphone over there. If you have any questions, if you're a, a lawyer, if you're a student, if you're just interested in the court system and how it plays out, uh, Please come and ask a question. But please tell us who you are, because we, we are, we'd like to get to know you. Hi there, I'm Chris Kinsinger. I'm articling with Miller Thompson. Uh, all of you at various stages of your careers have been lawyers and academics simultaneously. And so that's really what I want to ask uh, your advice on for uh, articling students and recent calls who are trying to pursue both of those things simultaneously. Uh, how do you go about that? And, and more specifically, how do you make the pitch to your firm that this is a good way of growing your practice and in showing that you are uh, in, engaging in scholarship and that, it, and that it brings value to the firm from a business perspective? I, I mean, as a person at a big firm, I would say that I've, I guess I've been lucky in the sense that my firm's always appreciated to a degree the extent uh, you know, the, the impact of what we would refer to as thought leadership. Um, but I think the question is, you know, I would say writing about, the, the question of what you're writing about matters, the question about how it applies matters. You know, writing about kind of obscure topics that have nothing to do with your practice um, is going to be a difficult sell. Mm -hmm. Writing about topics that you that are relevant to some area that you're practicing in is is a much less difficult sell turning your long scholarly articles into speaking opportunities and short bulletins for clients really makes the firm um, appreciate w what you're doing um, and then it's to some extent I don't know any, I, I don't know anything about the attitude at, uh, the attitudes at particular firms some firms are just going to naturally be less interested in that than others uh, just because of the nature of their business, their practice, their clients. Um, but I think that there's that showing that you're a smart person with interesting thoughts and a creative thinker, which is I think what real academic scholarship is, um, 
is, is, never, is never wasted. I should just clarify, my, clerm, uh, my firm has been quite receptive to the work that I've done. So. That's good. That's good. We'll keep it up because it uh, it's very satisfying. And the more senior you get, frankly, the, the less time you seem to have for it. So, My experience is that, especially in your first few years practicing, if you're making your hours, then most, I, I've always practiced at boutique firms. And the attitude from my senior partners early on was very much, well, you're making your hours, so we're happy for you to do whatever nerdy things you want to do on the side. And generally speaking, if you can say to the firm, look, here's a, a newspaper article that has your firm name on it, or here's a law journal article where your firm name is appearing on it, and boutique firms aren't used to seeing their firm names necessarily in you know, the National Post or in a law review article. So they actually, even if it's not something that intersects normally with the practice, they're, they're happy to see that. So I, I think the bigger challenge is as you, that I've found, is as you have a family and have kids, then it becomes a practical difficulty of how you can balance those two things. So my advice is get in as much writing as you can before you have kids. <laughs> Agreed. I, I agree with, with what Asher said. I, I practiced at a boutique litigation firm, and, and so I think you know, writing articles that are published in different things, like the Advocate Society Journal or, or those sorts of things are, are great. The other thing I think I would say that I found uh, really to be worthwhile, and again, it's something you do on your own time, is, is teaching, you know, teaching the younger lawyers, particularly, um, I did a lot of teaching of advocacy skills and that, sorts of thing, that sort of thing because it was something I was interested in. But I think, you know, as lawyers, we have a duty to do that, to be mentors to, to the younger lawyers and to help them, you know, become better lawyers. Um, and so that's, that's, I think, something that firms look highly upon as, as well. Yeah, the other thing I'd add um, is I think there's real opportunities for teaching at, at a lot of the law schools mm -hmm. these days, not least because they'll, they'll expect you to do it for free. They don't have any money, unfortunately. Uh, so that's a problem, but it's an opportunity. Um, and uh, practitioners can do a lot of good in a lot of courses. There's some courses that are, are better for academics, but there's some courses that are really good for practitioners. So I, or you could link yourself up with an academic and, and do something together. But Another way to approach that is to pick an area of law in which your firm has interests or, and wants you to develop in. And if you can twin that with uh, teaching something to teach yourself and, and to get the benefit of that, you get the, the overlap. And you get the same overlap if you can produce an academic quality article. That's going to help you get a job academically if that's what you wanted ultimately. The more you publish academic type work, the more seriously you're going to be taken. But you can take that academic work and spin it off in the way I think Andrew was suggesting into things for practitioners' journals, into talks for client groups, into newsletters on your website, and so on. You can get a lot of exposure all emanating up from that, that piece of academic work. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a question for the, the justices on the panel predominantly. Um, in your discussions today, you focused largely on a, a fairly formalist conception of, of legal reasoning. That is, you spoke about stare decisis, comparative studies, etc. But we all know that legal realism plays a significant role in, in judicial decision making. So could you perhaps explain to us what you think the appropriate role of legal reasoning is, uh, legal realism is in decision making, and how counsel can effectively make realist arguments to, to help you in, in, in your role? See, I, I don't like questions that start with, we all know that. I'm not <laughs> sure I know that. Um, and I'm not sure what you mean by legal realism. Yeah, I don't know what that means. So what do you, what, what, I don't know give me your terms. Uh, say the, the, the um, consideration of the equities of a case as opposed to simply the um, hard legal principles. I mean, the, the old adage I had always heard as a law student was, if the facts are on your side, argue the facts. If you lose on the facts, argue the law. So there must be some truth to that. Uh, to what extent do you use the facts as opposed to simply the hard rules of law in, in helping you make a decision? Well, the facts certainly do matter. Um, maybe, maybe that'd be better for you to tell. Well, of course the facts matter, but, but you know, you're constrained by, by the law, obviously, right? And so you know, sometimes you'll have a case, and I'm thinking in the civil context, that you know, is, is heart-wrenching, perhaps, but and, and you look at the equities of it, but but there still is is the law, right? That has has to be followed. And so, um, 
I, I guess um, I guess it's, it depends, obviously, on the case and what the what the equities are. But um, <clears throat> I, I guess I, w I would say, um, from my own perspective, you know, and, and Asher knows this because he did a long trial in front of me. But but evidence matters, and the law matters, and and. That you know, to to a large extent, drives drives the decision, and and so, um, <clears throat> you know, it's it's not it's not a results oriented uh, exercise, really. So um, I'm not sure that I understand sort of the the realism point that well, that you made. Maybe, but, I mean, mm -hmm. at, at its worst, in an academic sense, um, to to to, to suggest that something is legal realist inspired is to say that the judge is working backwards from result. no results. It's, are right. it's illegitimate. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that a good judge is, going, is not going to do that. They may well be influenced by the facts and they may well try really hard to understand the doctrine and, and, and might well regret because of the facts a bad result or what they think is an unfair result. But at the end of the day, the judge's job is to uh, reach decisions that they may not like. And if, if I liked every decision I made, I would say I'm not doing a good job. I'm not there to, to do everything I like. Right. You know, the law does constrain judges. And I, and I think I wouldn't be cynical about that. I think judges take very seriously the idea that you've got to work from principle on this. Of course, the facts are going to touch your heart on things. But nothing is so normative that you just get to say, well, I want the law to be whatever. I mean, Lord Dunning can pull it off, but it's very difficult to do for, for others. Yeah, and, and just following up on that, I, I, will, I will say that um, <clears throat> I think it's, it's much tougher to make the tough decision that, you, that you're compelled to based on the law and, and on, on the evidence in a case. You know, I think sometimes when I'm making a decision, I think, well, I can, I could go the easy way and do this, or I, but I don't feel that's actually the right decision based on the evidence, based on the law, and so it has to, it has to go this way, you know, um, and and you might not feel good about it, and some of those are really tough cases, they're really tough decisions to make, right? But um, I think that's our our job as judges to analyze the evidence and and the law and make make the decision based on that. I might be able to thread the needle just a little bit for you, um, just based on something that one of my colleagues said uh, it, earlier this week in a presentation I was giving with her. She said there's two reasons why a person does something, because they want to or because they have to. And I think that lawyers really, really strive to show judges that they both want to and have to do a certain thing, right? So if you're doing your job properly as a lawyer, the judge will you will say to yourself, I want the judge to want to do this, and I want to tell the judge why he or she has to do this. In my experience, um, judges do what they have to do, um, but it's much easier to persuade them that they have to do it if they also want to do it. And so the reasons why good trial lawyers focus so, so much on the facts is the facts are going to tell the judge what they want to do, and the law is going to tell the judge what they have to do, and then the combination, um, you know, have to always trumps want to, but it's wonderful if everything's just pointing in the same direction. I agree with Andrew. I mean, the problem for me with the realist critique in, in practice is that it's just like a pure theory of formalism. It's too simplistic. And, you know, I think what happened was a long time ago, everyone had this view of judges that they were, you know, men, only men at that time in black robes who were completely 100% objective, totally divorced from reality, and were going to, you know, weigh the scales and come out with the most uh, objective, non-partisan uh, answer possible. And that's impossible in any human institution. But what we see in practice is that the converse idea of that, the judges, that, you know, the law is whatever the judge had for breakfast, like that is a ridiculous critique, in my opinion, that's not borne out by, by experience. Judges are, are hardworking men and women. You know, Andrew, Andrew and I, there's a, the re, one of the reasons this motion that we did lasted five days is because the judge was so hardworking. 
because we had so many questions, because it was so clear that he wants to get it right, that he wants to do, as Andrew says, what he has to do. And, you know, if you've got, you can have extremely sympathetic facts. You can have, um, you know, a, a baby. You don't, but, but you could. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but like you, you, could, <laughs> you could have, you know, a, a, a breached, birth or something like that where, or maybe that's not a good example because it's uh, an infant, but you, you could have some terrible medical malpractice that is done uh, where someone is left paralyzed for the rest of their life due to medical negligence and the most sympathetic facts possible. But if they sue 10 years after the fact, no judge in the world is going to grant that lawsuit because it's outside the limitation period. And you could have literally the most sympathetic facts. You could have the judge forcing you know, tears back during the motion, but that is going to only go one way, and probably costs are going to get awarded against the plaintiff for bringing a motion they, they ought to know is going to fail because it's so far outside the limitation period. So that, you know, that's an extreme example, but that, that shows you that judges are applying the law, and the facts, yes, they weigh on them, but not, not to this great extent, or at least they shouldn't. Okay, let's go to the next question. Although I want to do say, first things first, I am the realist. <laughs> no, nothing? Icky Azalea? No? Summer of 2014? So fancy? Mm -mm. All right. Crickets. Hi. You guys were all studying law, weren't you? <laughs> I'm also studying law at the U of T right now. I have a question mostly directed towards the justices. So notwithstanding the fact that different people have, can have effective advocacy styles that differ, what do you find typically more effective? Do you find a calmer and more laid back conversational style more effective? Or do you find some of the intensity and pathos more effective? Because you see a lot of these cases and I wonder if it gets tiring when someone's advocating at full throttle with a lot of pathos. Yes, I think I like the calm style, um, the counsel that you know, are sort of over the top and making these assertions and and doing it in you know a very emotional fashion. I think I find it, it, it it's a bit wearing actually. Um, I prefer someone who isn't you know sort of flying off the handle. Sometimes you'll see counsel who are so um, taken with their case they'll jump up and interrupt the other counsel during their submissions, or they'll they'll say, oh that's not accurate, like right in the middle of the, of the submissions. They can't they can't restrain themselves. Um, that's poor behavior actually in the court, right? So I think I think personally I like to have counsel who are who have a calm demeanor and talk not at you know a hundred miles an hour, but talk at, at a tempo that I can I can write things down um, and I find that when you have lawyers that are emotionally driven, whether it's on a motion or at trial, there's a stress in the courtroom that, that I don't really like. And I find, you know, they're just kind of waiting there, waiting to jump up and object to something. And I just find it, it brings a tenseness that I, I don't like in the courtroom. So that's my personal preference. I, I was once arguing a motion, not a trial, a motion. And my, uh, the, the person on the other side, he was an articling student, and I was making my submissions, and all of a sudden he jumped up and yelled, OBJECTION! <laughs> you know, and, and, and the master said, you can't object at a motion, you know. <laughs> <laughs> like you'll have your... <laughs> They've been watching too much TV. Yeah, exactly. but it sounded really good, you know. Yeah. I, I, was kind of... <laughs> uh, I would say, uh, I, I think I agree with everything that Justice Wilson said. Um, Calm is better than not. What I would like is for people not either not always to be full on or putting me to sleep. Though mm -hmm. I'd like a bit of, you know, if it calls for a bit of animation and you haven't got it, I just think, oh. <laughs> on the other hand, if you come in on a criminal appeal and every time I see you, it's a miscarriage of justice. Every time, and you're pounding the table like that's not working either. If, on the other hand, you're mild mannered and you come in and you're measured and reasoned, and on the tenth time you come in and say, "Look, this is a miscarriage of justice," you're going to get a very different hearing because you've built credibility in the way you've acted in the past. You can't. Everything is not the end of the world every time. Everything is not, you know. And so you have to work with what you've got, work what the case is. But um, I don't think. I think when the Monotone presentation is calm, but that's no good. 
Uh, a bit of inflection is nice, but not everything. No, you know, and a bit of gesticulation because that's what I do uh, sometimes. <laughs> I don't mind it too much, but not too much. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be the boy who cried miscarriage of justice, or the girl who <laughs> cried miscarriage of justice. Okay, well, uh, as Andrew suggested, it's good to finish a little early. So I think we've got a couple more minutes, so it looks like there's no more questions. So thanks, everyone, for coming. I hope this was informative. And just a reminder that if you're a lawyer, uh, there, there is, well, I think the whole conference is eligible for substantive uh, CPD, but this con this presentation is eligible for some amount of professionalism CPD. I forget exactly how much, but we all need those hours, right? So, uh, yep. Thanks for coming. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you.